Hi, and welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and the show has been on air and online on podcasts, radio, and YouTube for 13 years this June. It's been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards, and I highly recommend that you subscribe to the show. It is syndicated on over 40 outlets, and when you subscribe, of course, the weekly shows pop right into your inbox, and all you have to do is press play when it's convenient. Or, of course, watch us live. That is fun, too. And for those of you who are paying attention on podcasts and you like to see the guest and I, definitely go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. I've had a lot of people write in and say that's like a whole heightened awareness, a whole nother something, something that they really enjoy watching and seeing what we're like. The animation takes it to a different level. Also, if you will leave a review. I kindly request that you leave a review. So many of you are longtime followers and listeners to this show. And when you do that, and you take a moment out of your time, you actually encourage others who are really hungry for this message. So you're doing a good deed to get them to the show to hear this number one transformation conversation. Dare to Dream is number 200 in all of self-improvement on Apple Podcasts. And we also rank really high in many other countries, South Africa, Vietnam, Slovakia, and more and more. And I love seeing the statistics roll in and how many of you are really enjoying what is presented here. A special thanks at the onset here to Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness for sponsoring this show. If you would like to do energy work and become a facilitator, attend a class, or read one of their books, go to drdanehere.com, also accessconsciousness.com. And I'm really excited to welcome back to my show after, I'm guessing it is a bare minimum of nine, 10 years since I've been on air for 13. Once upon a time, I had a publicist say to me back in my younger radio years, there's a book you need to read. She knew my taste. And she told me I had to pick up Paul Selig's book called I Am Word. I read the book, my jaw was wide open. I was really moved by the information and the wisdom they're in. And I contacted Paul Selig in New York City and I said, I don't know if you'd be willing to come on my show, but I'd really like to have that conversation. And not only did he say yes, but he flew from New York to Los Angeles to be with me at the station. And he is here again on technology. He's on that coast, I'm on this coast. And my question to you is, what would you like to know? Would you like to know what is beyond the known? Paul Selig is here, and he is considered to be one of the foremost channels today, and in his breakthrough work, all these amazing books that he's written with channeled literature, such as I Am the Word, the Book of Love and Creation, the Book of Knowing and Worth, the Book of Mastery, the Book of Truth, and the Book of Freedom, and his latest, Beyond the Known Realization which we are going to be talking about today. Author and medium Paul Selig has recorded an extraordinary program in all of his books for personal and planetary evolution. His work has been featured on ABC News Nightline, Fox News, the Biography Channel series, The Unexplained, Guy MTV's Beyond Belief, and the documentary film made by his friend and mine, Paul, uh, excuse me, Bill Bennett, Bill Bennett, PG, PGS, your personal guidance system. And Paul has appeared on numerous radio shows and podcasts, including Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie and Bob Olson's Afterlife TV. Paul offers channeled workshops internationally and serves on the faculty of the Kripalu Center and the Esalen Institute. He's a noted educator has served 25 years on the faculty of NYU, directed the MFA creative writing program at Goddard College, and now serves on the college's board of trustees. In New York City, where Paul is, he maintains a private practice as an intuitive and conducts frequent live stream seminars. You can find out more about him at his name, Paul Selig, S-E-L-I-G dot Com. And I very happily welcome Paul to the Dare to Dream show. It's great to have you back. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. It's great to be here. 
I hope that since you've been on my show, I think you mentioned that my radio show was the first you had ever done. Yeah. I hope it's been all uphill <laughs> from there. You know, that was a high place to start. So, you know, I'll, I'll put it that way. And I enjoyed it. And um, I recall at the time, the woman who told you about my work was somebody I didn't even know. She had written me and said, I'm a publicist. I read your book and I'd like to help you. And I thought, well, this is kind of astonishing. And so that's how it began. But yeah, I've I've been out there a lot since we spoke last. And there have been a lot of books that have come out since, and I just keep showing up for whatever is asked of me and, you know, trying to stay on my feet through it all. Well, I, I want to start there because, Paul, you are actually a reluctant medium channel. And I, I find this um, humility, this, this humbleness, if you will, to be really endearing. You're not somebody who shows up and says, I'm a guru or follow me. You actually have some trepidation with the position you've been put in. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, this isn't what I thought I'd be doing with my life. Um, you know, I, I work as a radio. That's how I think of my work. I'm a radio for these guides that dictate these books. And I seem to have this very odd skill set that allows for you know the channeling and the psychic work that I do. But I don't understand how it works. And I don't really think it makes me special. And I am a little bit confounded by the fact that this is happening and continues to happen. It challenges me enormously. Um, I mean, I've been doing this work for a very long time. I, I did a group that met in my apartment that began when I was about 31, 32 years old, and I'm now 58. Um, so it's not that I'm a newbie to the work, but I wasn't expecting to be known for it. I did the work in my apartment covertly. I wasn't seeking to be known for this at all. And when the book started coming, I had to step up to the plate and sort of acknowledge the fact that my name was on the cover of these, this book that I didn't write, and that I really couldn't pretend it wasn't happening, which is what I had been doing. I was, you know, sort of protecting my, my academic standing, you know, at the time. And I had a website without my name on it or without my photograph. You had to know somebody to get an appointment with me in those days. That's the only way I would, I would do a reading. But I show up anyway, and I, I do show up in spite of my confusion. I... You know, I don't consider myself the most evolved or ascended person out there, you know, and I can do this work if I show up authentically for it. And that includes with my questions and with my worry, you know, and those things that I, I hope to move beyond someday. But I don't know that the way to do that is to present myself as somebody who's enlightened because I'm just somebody showing up for the work as best he can. And that's what I have to offer, and I kind of leave it at that. And in your ability to get out of the way and show up authentically and really help people worldwide, at this point, it's just amazing since I first met you, mm -hmm. literally where you're operating today, mm -hmm. and how many people know of you. It seems to me divine or maybe guided by your guides, that all of this is happening and has been ordained. Mm -hmm. Do you receive assistance yourself as you assist others? Yeah, if I'm, if I'm willing to listen to it, mm -hmm. and that's the caveat here. I have free will, and the guides I work with don't override my free will, nor do they tell people what to do. They really don't tell me what to do, but if I ask, I can hear. The guidance I receive from myself is generally in the moment in the day. I'm not getting forecasts for myself. I don't know what my lucky numbers are. I don't know where or if I'm ever going to meet my partner. I'd love to get that information, but that's not how I'm treated. You know, the example I sometimes use is, you know, if I want to walk headfirst into traffic, they're going to let me. But if I say, is this a good time to cross the street? They'll say, not wise, you know, and it's still up to me what I do. So I am supported on that level. In terms of the career, if you want to call it that, or the work that's come to me through this, 
None of that was planned. I don't have a, a two-year or five-year plan. I never did. I try to show up for what I'm asked to do. And because I've been willing to do that often, when it's the last thing I want to do, for whatever reason, the right people have shown up mm. to support the work every step of the way. Mm. And that goes back to that publicist, you know, I think it was Makita, who yeah. called me and said, hi, you don't know me, but I read your book and I want to help. It was like, wow, you know, I don't think I knew what a publicist was. So, you know, that's how this has happened. And I continue to trust that if I continue to show up and, and stay open to what's next and not block it with my fear, my worry, um, it may well continue. Occasionally I meet people who are trying to get a career at this and I think, why would you want it? It doesn't make any sense. You know, stenography is, is what I do. I do verbal stenography for the guys. It's not terribly sexy if you think about it. It's taking dictation, it's channeling. Uh, but I don't know how one pursues a career at this. I think if you can show up for the work. And like I said, I did this for 18 years in my apartment with three or five or 20 people showing up for an evening and putting 10 or 20 bucks in a basket. And that was fine. I could order a pizza afterwards. I was happy, you know. So that's my story. And other people are showing up, I suppose, prepared in very different ways than I was. It took me some time to get ready for this. And who, pray tell, are your guides? Well, I call them the guides only because my ex, when my, this is years ago, when my ex found out I could do this, because I've been keeping it a secret, used to say, ask the guides this, ask the guides that. They got to be called the guides. Um, and they don't seem to mind the name. They're teachers, you know, finally. Um, they've called themselves different things. When they use a name, they'll say, if you wish to call us something, you may you know, call us Melchizedek, which is the name that they've come with, which is a priesthood. But, you know, my favorite uh, definition of who they are is, you know, I think it was something like, you know, we are, who, we are who you become when you know who you are. They're the realized self. Or, you know, and the realized self they use interchangeably with the, the, the term the Christ, which is their definition of the Christ is the aspect of the creator that can be realized in material form the true divine self, the infinite divine self. Um, they use that name and, you know, they've said ascended masters, teachers, but it's a collective. There's one that I've seen on occasion visually, and um, I both two or three times I've been so surprised, but he shows up quite the same and he's quite wonderful to see. He's got a long, long beard and a big, tall hat and beautiful, deep, deep, pale blue eyes. And I'm told that when I channel, and I haven't seen this, and the guides occasionally work with people individually, that my eyes turn bright blue and I have hazel eyes, but I know those eyes. Um, and he's got a wonderful sense of humor and deep, 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 deep compassion. Which I'm really moved by. I mean, when I've seen him, I've been in that energy. And I'm in that energy when I channel, which is you know, part of the reason I enjoy doing it, I get to sit in that field and become that, as it were, as they work through me. It's so beautiful. I love that idea of they are, you fully realized. There's so much power in that. And I would like to talk a little bit about this beautiful book. I don't know who designs these, but each one of them, they're so sumptuous. And in a sense, I mean, I do books, right, for a living. So I really appreciate how beautiful the simplicity, but the potency all at once. It's really clear, like you can feel there's something special in here. So the teachings in this book, we'll call it just realization for short, it's broken up into 28 days in order that we work towards manifesting our divine self, much like what you're saying. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So if we want to manifest a divine self, your book explains we need to shatter socially constructed identities. Wow. Mm -hmm. That we perceive ourselves to be. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, coming from an idea that we're complex and that it's often our subconscious running the show. We don't know it, right? But it's this projection we're living in. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, concurrently, it's hiding truths from us 
because we're mm -hmm. living under this really uh, limited idea of a reality. Mm -hmm. So if that said, and if we are living like that often, how can we fully tap into the reality of who we are if the subconscious is running the show? And then how do we smash the identity that we think we are? I don't think that the identity gets smashed. I, I don't get that there's anything wrong per se with what the guides call the small self, which is really just the personality structure. They say it's the mask that we operate with in, in, in commerce. You know, I'll say this is who I am and you say this is who you are and you know, that's where the post office is and this is what it costs to buy a quart of milk. I mean, these are all things sort of known at that level. They talk about the true self assuming the other aspects of us, which is reclaiming these aspects. Nothing is really, I think, cauterized per se or dismissed. I don't think reclamation happens at that level. The guides have said, you know, if you've got a body buried in the basement of your consciousness, eventually it's going to stink up the whole house. And so the opportunity is to release or re-see what has been buried. The guides speak extremely little about the subconscious. They really, it's not one of their terms. I think they may have used the term ego twice and maybe the term dimension or the word dimension five times in all of their books. But they have their own language, you know, for how they teach and what they teach with. Much of it seems to be based in music. They talk about octaves and realities, and highs and lows and sound. But my understanding, if I'm correct, and they may want to come in and correct me if I'm wrong, and that sometimes happens, is that the true self, the aspect of self who knows who it is, is not ruled by that patterning is not prey to the old tapes of indoctrination of who and what we were taught to be. So the true self in its reclamation, my understanding is assumes or reclaims all aspects of self, inclusive of those things perhaps that have been buried. In the Book of Truth, which was their sixth book, I think, um, no, it's fifth book, they talked about this time, and that book was dictated right before the last presidential election. And they said, what's about to happen is that the, they said, the energy of truth is here, and everything that's been buried is about to come up. You know, and they said, if you can include it within yourself and culturally, if you, they said, if you can imagine your backyard has now become an archaeological dig, and what was buried, you know, five days ago and 5,000 years ago comes to the surface, it's going to look like a bit of a mess. These things aren't coming up to be shamed or blamed or run from. They're coming up to be seen because nothing is healed. They say that's denied the light. So this process of exhumation, which I assume is inclusive of the beliefs that you're talking about, are all part of this process that they're taking us through getting to the true self. Okay, it, it's very apropos. We had a listener who wrote in uh, by the name of Corinne and her question for you was, uh -huh. how does Paul explain the extreme polarity that we are seeing right now in our politics and in our lives? Mm -hmm. And what do we do as individuals to bridge the gap? Well, I'm gonna say this first, cause you know, I'm not the author of the books, I'm the channel, you know? So when I talk, I'm trying to interpret the teachings. But the guides have said, and then I'll let them get into this if they want to come through. I wasn't planning on channeling, but it happens, you know, when I don't know the answer and they want to take it. The guides say the only problem humanity is facing right now, and there's only one, they say it's the denial of the inherent divine. That's the only problem. The divine that expresses in all things. They say you really can't be the light and hold another in darkness. And they say the action of fear is to claim more fear and who you put in darkness calls you to that darkness. And, you know, they've said for some time that fear is having its last hurrah and, and quite a big one. And I think a lot of the division that we're seeing right now or that polarity is sort of the playing out of this stuff. The guides say, you know, we've claimed separation from our brother, our sister, whoever's beside us, to such an extent that we've claimed separation from source. 
Now, they say, and none of this is a convenient teaching, God is all things, including the person you can't stand. You know, you really don't get to have it both ways. It doesn't mean you condone behavior or people aren't accountable to their acts. But to deny the divine in anyone, they say, is to deny it in yourself. You really don't get to have it both ways. Again, you can't be the light and hold another in darkness. So I'm going to see if I can do this now and see if they want to say anything about the times and polarity we enjoy doing so. They're saying we would enjoy doing so. You might have a choice. Humanity has made a choice. We'll be on an old to move beyond the old, the old system, the old systems of control. The mandate's born in fear. The mandate's born in fear. The attachment you have, the attachment you have to who you think you are, to who you think you are, plays itself on a grand stage, plays itself out on a grand stage. Who you believe others to be, who you believe others to be, who you would deny the divine in who you would deny the divine in, who you would deny yourself, who you would deny it in as yourself. These are the times you sit in. These are the times you sit in. All things must be made new. All things must be made new, reclaimed, re-seen. Reclaimed, re-seen in a higher octave, in a higher octave, the division you are seeing. The division you are seeing is the denial of the divine, is the denial of the divine projected upon others, projected upon others within the self, within the self, or within yourself, what you deny the light in, in yourself, you deny others as well, you deny in others as well, must be reclaimed, must be reclaimed, ready to move forth for humanity to move forward to a higher accord, to a higher accord, period. In the same period. So I didn't say when I channel, I whisper and repeat, and that's how it comes through. And it's awkward as all get out, but that's how it happens. Thank you. So with what they are sharing and with what is currently happening, that is basically showing us the underbelly, if you will. This is our separation. This is where we have divorced ourselves from our own divine divinity. Uh, mm -hmm. How, uh, two questions, I guess. The first is, what does this portend? What, what then is going to happen? How long do we need to be in this space of this chasm before- well, what they said, and they said this in the very first book, I Am The Word. I don't know if they're gonna give a timeline. They never do to me. But they said humanity is at a time of reckoning. And a reckoning is a facing of oneself and all of one's creations. And everything that's been claimed or created in fear needs to be reclaimed in a higher way. And they basically have said that everything that's built on fear has a basis in fear has to be renowned. And some of what we're encountering now seems to be the crumbling of the institutions right. that were sort of cemented in fear. And, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong, I guess, with a bank. You know, a bank is an idea that we've given great power to and great credence to, but it's what the bank has become or what religion has become or what government has become, you know? There's nothing wrong with the, with the principle behind any of this thing. It's the distortions that I suspect become attached to it that are being addressed. So the guides are now using this claim when they work. I mean, their whole work is the realization of the innate divine. That They say that's who you truly are, who I truly am. Everything else is just an idea that we've gone into an agreement to in a lower, lower vibrational field. The realization of the divine self, they say, calls to you a different level of, of, of resonance, tone. And they say, because we are in agreement, and agreement means vibrational accord to everything that we see, which means if you can see it, you're in accord to it. It doesn't mean you made it happen. It means you can see the sky, you're in accord to the sky, you see the war, you're in accordance with the war. The consciousness that you bring to anything claims that in vibration and claims your relationship to it. As you lift to what they call the upper room or the higher octave of experience, you lift what you encounter to you, and that's how the world is made new, they say. Mm -hmm. Through a teaching of co-resonance, it's who the perceiver is. They say God sees God in everything. You see, it's really very simple. And the true self, the divine self and realization, can't deny the divine in anyone else. That's always the act of the small self, who's been taught what to agree to, what to value, how things should be based on historical edicts. Okay. So I don't get a time frame on this. I just get that we're in it, and we've got a whole lot of work to do. 
Mm, okay. So you and the guides talking about beyond perceived limitations. Mm -hmm. And in the book, it goes into achieving ultimate manifestation. Well, you know, them's fighting words, right? There is these that's, the, oh, that's, oh, that's the publisher's definition of, of the text, not mine. I don't think the guides have ever said ultimate manifestation mm -hmm. because I don't know if there's an ultimate manifestation. I think that there are always higher levels of awareness to come to. I think what the guides are teaching is what they say is the level of realization that can be attained while maintaining form. Mm -hmm. They talked about the upper room. This, I'm, I'm explaining it this way, it's simple. The guides say that we're living in an octave. Uh, an octave is comprised of high and low notes. It's musical tone and vibration. Everything that we know is expressing within this octave. They say any piece of music can be sung in a higher octave. It can be, I don't know what the word is, um, transposed to a higher key. The teaching that they're bringing through is the teaching of how we are transposed to operate in a higher key. At that level of vibration in the upper octave, you're not bound by the systems of agreement that express in the lower. So imagine this, you know, we all know like dogs can hear notes that humans can't hear. There are notes that we don't hear because we're not in alignment to them. And there are levels of awareness that we're not in alignment to at this level. So what the guides say, the next octave is, they call it the upper room, is the level that we can operate through while maintaining form. The challenge is we're still in bodies, we're still operating. The bodies themselves have to go through a process of what they call rearticulation. They say part of the problems we've had, or some of the problems we've had, are based on this old schemata that if there is a God, it's up there in the heavens and we're stuck here in the mud. And they say, well, God is the mud, and it's also your body. You can't exclude the divine in form. If you exclude the divine in form as yourself, you must thereby, you know, be excluding the divine that expresses in all manifestation. And then you're operating again with the denial of God being the problem. Right. There's a quote from your book, which is, now when we teach you about manifestation, we're taking two things into consideration, that you want things and that you assume that God is supposed to give them to you. These are both wrong-minded and we must tell you why. So when I was reading this passage, and beyond, I was wondering, is the realization there that when we have this desire and it calls to us, that it also comes equipped with a level of alignment with source already providing what's needed. In other words, the path is clear. That's what I understand exactly, yes. You know, the guides have said, you know, there's nothing wrong with a house on the hill. Somebody gets to live there, but why do you want it? And if you want it so that you can be the envy of your neighbors, you're operating in fear. And, you know, all of these things that we think we're supposed to have or get or want, they're basically the ideas that we've inherited. They're the shoulds that we operate with. And the true self, they say, doesn't operate that way. But yes, I get that if, you know, you're operating at the level that they teach, you're provided for. That's the level of vibrational accord that you come to. You know, the heart's desire is the true self's expression that's my understanding i heard lionel richie uh who was once with the commodores just mm -hmm. the other night i was watching him on tv and he was uh, talking to an aspiring singer who was talking about oh, i wrote a, write all these songs but i live in arkansas yeah i thought about nashville but you know right now i've got a job and lionel richie looked at him and said you know you can circle the pond and you can circle the pond and you can think about how right it's going to be if you do what you want to do, or you can jump into the pond. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, that's really very powerful advice to give it to is. somebody, right? Mm -hmm. You're basically saying the pond is your desire and you're so busy going around and around it, cogitating, is this right mm -hmm. to do? What will happen if I do? How will it turn out if I do? Mm -hmm. And doing all the right things, but basically you're never swimming. You're never doing your heart's desire, and it's still there, in fact, right in front of you, calling and beckoning to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really apropos for so many people who have such a strong, compelling desire to do something, but um, 
live out of this fear, live out of this concern, this uh, self-protection. I read for people, you know, and, and, and so often, you know, one of the, one of the th teachings of the guides is this attunement. I know who I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know how I serve in truth. And the guides say how we serve is how we're most fully expressed as the true self. Mm. It doesn't have to be your career, you know, but people in this culture tend to think it's what the career is and that's how you serve. But, you know, I don't know, when, when I, was, I was reading for somebody once, and, you know, the question came up, what would you do if you could do anything? If you weren't worried about how it looked, or what the salary was, or what your parents thought of it, or what would you do if you could do anything? And it's amazing how many people never ask that question, mm. you know? And that's usually the answer. You know, I was reading once for an attorney, and he wasn't very happy, and he was a very successful man. And I tuned into him and I said, you know, you're not going to want to hear this, but I'm seeing you tending bar. And he looked at me with such sadness and he said, you know, the happiest summer of my life was after college when I was tending bar. And this may have been somebody who could have had a great life as a bartender, mm. you know, and chose what he was supposed to choose or what one is supposed to choose. And I think moving beyond those shoulds is a big way to to enter into the new. Yeah, indeed. And speaking of shoulds, I'm also curious about how much we create. So I was thinking about this this morning, knowing that I was gonna be talking to you and thinking about when is a cigar just a cigar? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people, for instance, today who have autoimmune diseases. And yeah. no joke, you know, it really yeah. is, is not fun, whichever one on the buffet somebody has, but it can be a very painful and uh, difficult life producing, physical producing experience. So for instance, an autoimmune disease, are these things always at some level co-created and created at the level of thought? Or sometimes is it soul destined to have that experience in one's life? I don't know. You know, I mean, this is again a question for them. I, I personally suspect that both are true. You know, in the new age, you hear, well, you create everything, you create your own reality. And the guides I work with don't quite say it that way. They say you're in accord with everything, which means vibrational accord. But there's the personal and the collective. Mm -hmm. So again, it's like, I said to them once, so does that, mean, does that mean if there's a book on the table in Paris, I'm in accord with it? And they said, the moment you know that there's a book on the table in Paris, yes, because your consciousness informs your relationship to it. But it doesn't mean I created the war in Iraq. It does mean that I confirm the war through consciousness and through alignment. Mm -hmm. So the idea being, and this is the example I use at times, you know, because I, I get a little fed up with people sometimes saying, well, you created your illness. And I think, you know what? If you grow up next to a toxic waste dump and you're drinking the water, you know, and you're getting sick from the water. Um, did you create that? Did your two-year-old create that? I don't know. I do think that everything is finally an opportunity to learn, finally can be seen that way and must be seen that way so that we don't begin to operate through victimhood as a structure. But I also believe that the collective is claiming reality and then we're in agreement to the collective. Mm -hmm. So the guides have said, you know, you live in a world that has known war for so long that you can't imagine being without it. Wow. Consequently, you're always going to be claiming war, and that's an expectation you have. They say until you, humanity rises to a level of consciousness where war is not an option, you're going to have it. War doesn't exist in what they call the upper room. Fear doesn't exist. War is an expression of fear. Whether is war is whether war is based in greed or borders or you know oil, what have you, you know. The action of fear is to claim more fear. And they say many of the things that we call something else are actually just ways that fear is being expressed. In the workshops that they do and in the books, they bring people to this level of vibration. They call it the upper room. And once they get them there, they'll say, you know, what, what, what are you frightened of? And there's nothing there. Mm. At that level, you're not afraid. It doesn't exist. 
But we get provoked and we go right back downstairs to where we know ourselves and our comfort. You know, the guides basically say, you know, you're used to living in a basement apartment with a basement view and we can take you up to the 10th floor. And, you know, you, you get up there and you go, but all my crap is down, down there in the basement and you run back downstairs to reclaim it. And it's a choice. It's the divestment of the old. It's the release of those ideas. I suspect, and the attachment to what things should be, which is the level of entrainment to the collective that allows us to move beyond it. Mm. Well, we're going to take a very quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking about attunements to energy. This is Debbie Dashinger on Dare to Dream podcast. And next rolling out is an anthology. For those of you who've been with me for a long time, I coach how to write a book and a book that is a page turner. I figure if you're gonna take the time and books take time, then write something that we all are gonna really love reading. I have also got a company that takes authors to guaranteed international bestseller, and I teach the ultimate visibility formula at debbied.net slash visibility about how you can be interviewed on radio and podcasts in 60 days or less and get really great results. Right now, I've got an amazing new project rolling out and it is an anthology book, a compilation about dogs, one of my favorite subjects. And I wanted to do something a little bit more lofty and whimsical. And I wanted to talk about something that I think is a game changer. I have my first dog, she's four years old, and she has completely changed my life. So if you have a dog, have had an experience with a dog, are ready to become an author, this book will be taken to a guaranteed international bestseller. I'm going to help everybody with every piece of the process. It will be fully edited for you with a beautiful book cover. And the entire start to finish will be fully done for you. We are just about to take applications and the doors are now open. And when the 25 chapter slots are full, the doors will close. You can go to debbied.net. It's D-E-B-B-I, no E, D-E-B-B-I, D.net slash anthology read more there there's also a video for you and if you're ready to register or want to get some friends in on it too make sure you book your chapters today and if you're just tuning in after we've started this is dare to dream i'm speaking with paul selling he is the author of several books his latest that we're discussing is beyond the known realization and you can find out more at his name paul s-e-l-i-g Dot com. And Paul, you say that the guides work with attunements to energy. Mm -hmm. What is an attunement? I mean, we're talking musicality and I have a huge background in music, so I'm already feeling that. And I know from your book, but talk about in um, this form, what that means to attune and how does it work and how can we self-facilitate? Well, the attunements are in all the books and, you know, they're probably up on YouTube at this point as well in varying videos because the guides always do them. And, you know, the attunement is supporting us in a reclamation of, of who and what we are. The very first one that they brought through was the attunement to what they called the word. And they said the word is the energy of the creator in action. And what they are are spoken invocations that work directly on the energetic field. So if you've studied Reiki or something like that and your teacher, you know, attuned you to the energy through your hands, this is done through language and intonation. It's the sound of the words and the intent behind the words that calls the attunement into being. They're all really very palpable. People can generally feel them, you know, right away when they say them and they build of one upon the next. So it's a simple way to think about it. Um, if you think about... I don't know, playing a jukebox and you plug your, you, you, you press the button, a certain song plays. When you claim the attunements, what you're doing basically is tuning the radio that you are to play the level of broadcast that comes. So the guides say we're all radios, we're always an expression. Our expression is your consciousness. That's really, you know, what it is. And what they're doing is they're supporting us and playing the stations that they say have always been there, but we haven't known we could align to. So that's what the attunements are. They progress throughout the books. There's the one in Beyond the Known Realization is the claim I have come, which yeah. is say the claim of the true self and manifestation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's claimed, they say, in what they call the upper room. 
um, the first series of attunements was all about the alignment of form, body, um, energetic field, and identity to the higher. Um, I know who I am in truth, which they say is claimed by the true self. I know what I am in truth, which is the manifestation of the divine in form. And I know how I serve in truth, which is the expression of it. And then they lift us in that level to what they call the upper room. And then the next spade of attunements come from there. They're, they're quite something. I'm, I'm just getting comfortable with what they're teaching now because they keep moving me well, well beyond my comfort zone. Um, mm -hmm. That's always quickly. Great. It seems because <laughs> it, it, it's amazing how it just in the last nine years from what I first experienced of you and you were brilliant back then, but this is, uh, and of course I saw you recently in your workshop in Los Angeles and it's like, wow. And you basically were channeling people who asked you questions. Um, so that you could give them an answer of their experience and then some guidance. And it was incredibly powerful. I've never seen anything like it. Well, they call me a medium for the living. So, you know, I'm a radio. So when I'm channeling the station that I'm playing is the guides and I'm taking dictation. But if you ask me to read for you and you want to know what's going on in your relationship with your sister to give me your sister's name, I just tune into your sister and I play her station. She'll be talking to me, and I can hear and, and relay that. And um, it's it's quite accurate, I'm told. And I've been film doing it with people that I've never met and seen, and I often take on their physicality. It's it's an interesting ability. I sort of a, I guess a form of of clairsentience is the best way that I can I can understand it. But I consider that the psychic work, and I consider the channeling the spiritual work because the guides are teachers. You know, they don't really seem to care whether I get a partner or whether I figure out where I'm supposed to live. I mean, that's my business and I can, you know, use my means to get there, but they do very much care about the level of consciousness that we operate in and the level of, of, of realization that we can come to if we choose it. Well, I have a question for you and or them. So I have a lot of dog-eared pages in here yeah. and, and, and at, at some point, I mean, at first I was yellow highlighting, and at some point I just started realizing these attunements were blowing my mind. Mm -hmm. And what I love to do every day is emotional freedom technique. It's really powerful for me, EFT. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, but I would want your, their blessing to go back through this and to make recordings for my ears only, mm -hmm. but to make recordings of these doing the meridians and mm -hmm. tapping to yeah. really release anything that is not this, the truth, the highest, uh, truest self, and to allow in the energy of this completely. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think that's fine. I know others have done it. I hear the stories. So yes, you can work with this. It's your energy system. You know, the attunements are there for you to work with. Um, I, you know, I people have muscle tested that themselves to see where they're at with them. You know, the guides I work with do this thing called the mudra of creation, which is another way of sort of understanding how you're aligned and what level of alignment you're, you're in agreement to. But that sounds good to me. So enjoy it. Let me know how it goes. I will. It'll be a lot of work. I can tell you right now because there's quite a few of these attunements in here. Yeah. But yeah, they indeed uh, build. And, it, you know, there's like clarity and then it's ingested, and then you know, a few pages later, later more. It's like architecture, and yeah, I like yeah. what it's building. I'm glad. Thank you. So the um, re-articulation, let's talk about that. So what does it mean to be re-articulated as the true self? Let me see if I can do this, or I'm, I should go to them. I'm pooped today. You have to forgive me. So sometimes when I'm tired, I'm not at my best. But that doesn't seem to stop the guides so much. So the guides say that everything is in articulation. Do you understand this? Everything in form is an articulation of source. There is one note, they say, being played in the entire universe that's played out as everything we see. So God is all things. It's just vibration operating at different levels. And they talk about God as, as sort of the, the infrastructure of everything. You know, it's what makes everything. They use the metaphor of paint on a canvas. So say you have 
a bunch of paint and then you add pigment to it, it takes different colors and then you render images on the canvas and suddenly there's narrative, that's a ship at sea and that's a sunbather and that's a sky and a moonlit night. Um, but frankly, it's all paint. It's all one thing that's being seen and depicted in different ways. So everything we see, they are saying is in articulation. Rearticulation is the transposing or the lifting to the true nature beyond the structure of the false self that we've been operating through. Again, there's nothing wrong with personality. They're not pretending we don't have it. It's a process of reclamation. They say, you know, we've been operating at a masquerade ball, you know, and the masks are coming off. You know, we're not what we do for a living. We're not our gender. We're not our age. We're not what people think of us. Mm -hmm. We're something far more than that. And the realization of the that, the thing that we're far more of, is what they're teaching us. And that's the self and a higher expression, which is rearticulation. Got it. How is there a methodology? Is there a way we can speak it into the upliftment? Is there a way we can? Yeah, it's all, that's what the books are all about. It's all about a system. You know, it took me a long time to, to understand what they were really doing. Mm. When I was young, in my, like, 31, you know, I asked in, in deep sincerity, and it's a much longer story, but I said, I want to go all the way with this in a real belief that it was so, and I believe that what the guides are delivering is a way for people who want realization to claim it. It's a mystical teaching. This isn't self-help. It's not how to, you know, get a better looking boyfriend or a bigger house. I mean, that this, that those things are fine, but that's not what the teaching is. So how can I say this? Um, I don't remember what I was saying because I, I took a I took a, a quick digression. Um, yeah, so the question was about how can we rearticulate? No matter where we're vibrating, how can we make that choice to go to the upper room? And is there a choice, or is there a process, or is there a something? It's a choice and it's a process. I remember what I was going to say in the very first book. I am the word. There was a line in it, and they said, "The Christ in man or humanity is an event that happens." And I just thought, well, that's nice. That maybe that means we all, you know, get to be a bit more spiritual, a little bit nicer to each other. I, I didn't know. They're really talking about realization at that level. And the process of realization, which comes in stages, is what they take us through in the books. So the first six books, in a lot of ways, I think were preparatory for realization, mm -hmm. which is the book of the upper room. What they're teaching now, because there's another book coming out in August that's done, I've just been proofing it last night, is really what the process is between the octaves, the process of divestment, the process of releasing fear and unforgiveness and all of sort of the cultural edicts. It's a really interesting book. I, I was... I, I don't read the books until I'm usually in the recording studio and I do the audio books because I just... The books are all dictated verbally. There's no speaking. There's no writing at all. And the last three or four books were dictated entirely in front of audiences. So the recording goes off to the transcriptionist, and then I'll proof it. But I can't really read it until it's in print and typeset. Mm. Because then I, I can read it like somebody else delivered it, and it can come through my mouth. But the process is, is, is rather astonishing, and it does build. And I suspect that where they're taking us is to a level of authenticity, for lack of a better word, that, you know, we can't really quite comprehend because we're so enmeshed in the idea of who we are mm -hmm. and who we're supposed to be that sort of operating beyond that feels like an impossibility. I know it does for me mm -hmm. still at times when I'm reading these things. But I can feel the energy, and you know, the guides have been enormously consistent over these dictations. I don't think they've contradicted themselves yet in, you know, what's now six, eight books. You know, I, I had, um, I can have the most extraordinary experience of what you're talking about in the most unexpected times. I was at a yoga class last week, 
which mm -hmm. typically is just a yoga class for me. Mm -hmm. But at the very end, after Shavasana, we were sitting and just in a meditative state, breathing, and that was it. And honestly, although much of my life is fa fantastic, there are a few elements that are, um, there's a lot of shift and change happening right now. And with that shift and change is a lot of discomfort. And with the discomfort is coming the feelings, which for me, for sure, are a lower vibration. And I was sitting there just, uh, you know, on my mat and just all of a sudden, out of nowhere in that position, I realized the incredible power residing within me and the incredible light and that all was truly well in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I felt so glorious. I mean, so at peace and at one and, and the recognition was really pretty amazing to me that in just a breath, that could be acquired like that and that remembrance could come mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in such an unexpected way i was so deeply grateful mm -hmm. and i realized well that i have access to that anytime yeah. and of course it completely changed the trajectory the moment i got up and walked out i could i couldn't forget what i had just remembered mm -hmm. that's how it happens you know my biggest experiences were completely unplanned mm. and life-changing truthfully you know it's what's kept me on the path frankly it's not because i want to channel it's because i've had those glimpses of of unity that are so extraordinary that i don't want to be without it mm. yeah the unity really is home i feel mm -hmm. and Gosh, I, I would have to go back and listen to your interview nine or 10 years ago to hear what you said back then. It would be really yeah. pretty joyful to hear. But here we are now today, and it is Dare to Dream. And what are your next dreams, Paul? What are your next goals or future visions for yourself? You know, I'm, I'm moving out of a period, I really think, beginning with the dictation of the last book, which began around this time last year, last March, I've really been in what feels kind of like a deep exhumation of self and a lot of uncomfortable confronting of parts of myself. And I'm hoping that that changes soon because it's tiring, you know, it's real work. But I'm grateful for what I believe is on the other side and I do, trust the guides on this one when they sort of explain to me that this is the process and this is just what you signed on for when you do some of this work. On a very practical level, my dreams are, are very simple. I want to like where I'm living. I want to be in a partnership that feels good. But I have to be careful. I was once chatting. I was at the Essel Institute. It was about five years ago. And somebody asked me, I don't know what it was, but I remember saying in, in this group, all I want is a, is, a, is a partner and my dog to live forever. That's what I said. And I got, that night I was, that afternoon, all the students left, I was sitting alone in a hot tub at Esalen, which is beautiful, and my skull started to hurt and I heard cancer and I went, oh my God, I have, a, I have brain cancer, what's going on here? I went home to see my dog, I hadn't seen her for a week. She started seizuring that night. She was on in a day, she had a brain tumor. She waited for me. And so I'm careful what I say, I want my log dog to live forever. But what the guides had said to me after I said that was that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be kind to the dog, you know? So I'm, I'm a little cautious about some of these wishes now. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for what comes, put it that way, and continue to be. Yeah. And in, in your book, previous to this one, the book of truth, you have a quote, which is, what am I to learn puts you in a position of humility and authority in any instance. Yeah. Is that what you're referring to when you say you've been through this t t time of introspection and exhumation and all? That's introspection. I mean, the metaphor that the guides were using through this whole period when they taught was the metaphor of being on a ship at sea between two different continents. And the new continent is the unknown, it's the unexplored. And the process of sort of moving from one level of being, one way of knowing the self to another, is rather like going through a, a storm at sea. And sometimes the best you can do is hold on to the mast mm -hmm. and trust 
that you're being navigated well because you can't really chart uncharted waters when you're doing some of this work. It's easy to sort of say, well, this is what's happening and this is that, but that's always referencing the old. Do you understand? It's always a way of sort of trying to manage and control. So I don't know that that's what this process is, but the quote that you spoke is very much that. Mm-hmm. It's very much that. And what am I to learn is the great question. The guides have said, you can't be a master and a victim at the same time. It's not possible. Mm-hmm. Anything you'd like to say here at the end, Paul? I think it's very nice to be back with you. I. I was up all night proofing the new manuscript, which was late, so I had to send that in. So I'm, I'm hoping this was, this was coherent for you today, but I'm grateful to be here, and, um, and it's nice to see you, so nothing else to add. Yes, uh, for me as well, and it's so beautiful to revisit, and hopefully you'll be back with your next book. Sure. I'm happy to, to keep having you here and visiting this ongoing conversation. And thank you so much for sharing your brilliance today. So grateful. Thank you. And folks, I end today's show with this quote from Paul Selig's The Book of Mastery. Now, if you count on your hands the times you were wrong about anything, you will be counting for a very long time. But if you were to count again about how much you learned through everything you deemed to be wrong, you would be counting just as much. Tune in to the upcoming interviews. Subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast because in the upcoming number one transformation conversation, you will be able to hear James Redfield, Karen Reese, and Dr. Sue Mortar, who's back for her third time. Subscribe to the inspirational YouTube videos at youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. And if you would like to contribute a chapter as an author to the book about dogs, the compilation about dogs, go to debbyd.net slash anthology. That's D-E-B-B-I D dot net slash anthology. And remember that the secret of success in your dreams always is about having courage to begin in the first place. <laughs>